maybe I'll go ahead and get started because I know we have a lot of good material for the day and I want to make sure we have as much time as possible. So I'm going to welcome everyone to the um, Lee Kum Shung seminar series. Um, this is our second seminar of the year. Um, and our theme is, um, actually Malia just took the slide down. I think our theme is <laughs> recovery and resilience. Um, and so we're delighted to have so many people here. Um, and we're really excited to have Arthur Brooks with us today. Um, he is professor of the practice of public leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School and the Arthur C. Patterson faculty fellow at the business school. Um, his research interests include conservatism, free enterprise and philanthropy, as well as thinking about uh, happiness and uh, factors that, that uh, um, in, uh, increase happiness and, and also outcomes of happiness. Um, before joining the Harvard faculty in July of 2019, he was the president of the American Enterprise Institute, which is a public policy think tank in Washington, D.C., Many of you may be familiar with his work actually as a columnist for The Atlantic and host of the podcast, The Art of Happiness with Arthur Brooks. Um, I know I get those um, column updates on a regular basis and they are a bright spot of light in the middle of this kind of dark time. So I really appreciate it. And I, I, I think they're just a wonderful um, synthesis of what we have been learning over the last several decades about happiness. So it's really, Exciting to have him with us today. He's going to present three life lessons from COVID-19. We can come out happier than we went in. Now that is a, a good news story <laughs> that we could all use. Um, after the seminar, we will have an opportunity for students to join us for a virtual meet and greet with Dr. Brooks, which is at two o'clock. So if you've already RSVP'd, you'll have the Zoom link in your email. But if not, you could still RSVP by clicking on uh, the link in the chat that Malia will put there for us today. Um, and so please note that the meet and greet session is in a separate Zoom meeting from the main seminar. So if that's of interest, um, please go ahead and join. And other, otherwise, I'm gonna hand it off to um, Arthur. One last note, sorry, <laughs> just kidding. Um, People have questions, please put your questions into the chat um, and I will organize the questions and pose them to um, Arthur at the end of the talk. Um, and we have asked him to leave us enough time so we'll have a good time for Q&A. So now I really mean it, it's over to you Arthur, thanks. Thank you, Laura. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. What a delight to be a part of this seminar series. Uh, our, our regret is always that we're not together in person but this technology makes it possible for more people to see these types of presentations than ordinarily would. And my guess is that coming out of the coronavirus epidemic, we're gonna be in a hybrid life more or less permanently. And what I wanna talk about today is what that means, what that means to all of us. We've experienced a lot of pretty hard uh, events, uh, traumatic events even over the past year. Those of us even who have not gotten sick or lost our jobs, it's been a tough time. And the question for us is what have been the learning opportunities and have we taken them? And are there still possibilities for us to learn, to grow, to become happier <clears throat> than we were before? Now, you heard that my main area of, of study is actually happiness. And I retired as the president of a think tank in the middle of 2019 in Washington, DC, which was at the center of policy and politics and kind of the vortex of lots of controversy because you know politics is politics. And when I stepped down, I decided I was going to leave all that behind. So the truth is, I don't do anything politically. I don't do anything in the world of ideology. I'm dedicating the rest of my professional career, no, the rest of my life to lifting people up and bringing them together. My subject is love and happiness. That's what I want to bring to, as a social scientist, you know, working on the, the social science and neuroscience of love and happiness, but more importantly, how to apply it to our lives and how to teach it to other people. So I teach a class at the Harvard Business School called Leadership and Happiness, which is hugely oversubscribed, not because of me, but because happiness, right? And, and one of the things that I teach them is if you really want to be happier, you need to understand the science, practice it in your life, and most importantly, share it with others. Now, I'm practicing what I preach. Today, I'm going to share ideas with you. And here's the secret. 
I'm going to get happier as a result of it. But also what I'm going to ask you to do is if you like this presentation, you learn something from it, I want you to explain these ideas to other people as well so you can cement these ideas into your life. Okay, now, when I first came to Harvard, I had no idea how much of a, uh, an experimental lab and happiness I was about to start to experience. I had no idea I was going to get to Harvard, and six months later, we're all going to go home because of the global pandemic, and, and people were going to be talking about how miserable they were, and, and suddenly my work is, was going to become more relevant than I thought it was going to be. But that is the subject I want to talk about today, because as you're going to see, it has really given us a whole lot of opportunities to understand ourselves, to understand others, to lift each other up, and to actually come out better than we went in. That's my job today. Let's see if I can convince you. And I'm going to start by sharing my screen so that we can, it's usually better when we're in the Zoom environment to not just look at a talking head on the screen, but to actually look at some visuals. Life lessons from COVID-19. This is what I've been writing about in the Atlantic. I have a book coming out about this in February, and I'm, I'm really delighted to be able to talk with you about it here today. So let me start with this picture here. <clears throat> These people are people who are well-known to me and beloved by me. These are my mother and father-in-law in Barcelona. My father-in-law now of blessed memory of a couple of years ago. My mother-in-law is still alive. She's 92 years old. My mother-in-law there uh, in, in the picture. And um, they were happy. This is when they were 21 years old. They were just newly married and, and, you know, in love and happy. It wound up not being a happy marriage, unfortunately. And this happens sometimes. By about five years into the marriage, it was clear that there was not a high degree of understanding. And let's just say not a very high level of good behavior on the part of my father-in-law. My father-in-law wound up being a really great grandfather, but he wasn't a very good father and he wasn't a very faithful husband, unfortunately. And, and some years into the marriage, not very many, when my wife uh, was a little girl, was six years old, he, he left with another woman. He didn't pay child support. Um, it was a bad situation. And this is during Franco era Spain. This is in Barcelona. And, and so there were no protections. It wasn't like what we would think about. Well, just go to the courts. No, there wasn't any redress for my mother-in-law. And she went through a huge amount of hardship with my wife grew up with the electricity being cut off unexpectedly, not knowing if they'd have money to buy groceries. It was, it was terrible. And I was talking to her recently about that because we're very close. I'm much closer to my mother-in-law than I was to my own mother. And, and, you know, she's, I spent the whole summer, I spent every summer in Barcelona and I was talking to her about it this year and, and, and she was reminiscing about it. And she said, that was just the worst time of my life. But you know what? It was actually the best thing that ever happened to me. I said, what? What are you talking about? She said, I mean, I didn't want it to happen. I, I'm still sorry he did that. I'm still sorry that this happened to me, that this happened to my family, the deprivation, the poverty, the, the heartache. But you know what? When he took off, I went back to school. I became a teacher. I got my own friends. I built my own life. I became me. And that wouldn't have happened. I wouldn't know, have known who I am as a person, my mother-in-law told me, had that terrible thing not happened. And I got to thinking, as a social scientist, this is actually one of the most common stories one hears about trauma. Let me tell you one of the most frequent phenomena that we see in the, in the literature on, on, on pain, sacrifice, and trauma. And that is the story of post-traumatic growth. There are many people have written about this. There's a huge literature on this. And we have a tendency to, to focus all the time on post-traumatic stress disorders that actually come from, from trauma, which are no joke. But the, the, the truth of the matter is when you, when you survey the literature appropriately, that there is a much higher likelihood after trauma of experiencing post-traumatic growth than post-traumatic stress. And it has miraculous impacts on people. My mother-in-law's story turns out not to be unusual really at all. What you find is that when, when people live through trauma, which they ordinarily do, and, and by the way, I'm not saying go out and look for trauma because trauma is going to find you one way or the other. So, I mean, we all deal with problems that we don't want to. And if we're not right now, we're going to be to before too long. But what we find is that most people get through them and they, and they, and they grow as a result. And here, here's a sort of a list, a, a non-comprehensive list in the literature, the social psychology literature, about what people experience after traumas, ordinary traumas, kind of like what my mother-in-law suffered, or death in the family, or the rupture of a relationship, or the bankruptcy, or a loss of a job, all these traumatic transitions that people don't, don't choose. 
they find that afterward their relationships are deeper, permanently deeper with the people who, who suffered with them. They find that, and this is kind of a superpower, they, they care less what other people think of them. One of the wonderful things about growing through trauma is that you just don't care what other people think. And what a wonderful thing to not care what other people think. There's greater resilience to future trauma, which I know is one of the themes, the light motifs of this particular series is resiliency. And people do tend to be resilient. And in, in, in point of fact, people get stronger with trauma in much the same way that people, when they exercise a muscle, the muscle gets stronger because you're actually exposing the muscle to damage, to trauma. And then people also find a much higher level of philosophical depth, adroitness, even spirituality as a result. This is a non-comprehensive list, but what it shows us is that there's real benefit that comes from from sacrifice, from pain, and even from trauma. One of the things that I talk about with my class at the Harvard Business School is that, that happiness, which is the subject of the class, actually has three macronutrients to it. Kind of like food has macronutrients of protein, carbohydrates, and fat. Happiness is made up of enjoyment, satisfaction, and purpose. And purpose, paradoxically, requires traumatic experiences. Nobody says, I found my purpose in life on that wonderful vacation to Ibiza with my friends. That's not how people find their purpose. People find their purpose when they're put to the test and people don't like to be put to the test. It's hard, it's difficult, it can be, it can be you know, something that can be one of the worst experiences of our life and yet people will always track their purpose back to these difficult times. Happiness paradoxically relies on unhappiness and the connective tissue between the two is post-traumatic growth. Now, why do I bring this up? Because here's my main question today. What can we get from COVID-19? Now, again, blessedly, I'm sure that most people on this call, because I'm looking at the data on the coronavirus epidemic, most of you um, didn't get sick. Um, probably most of you didn't lose a close family member, although some of you perhaps did, in which case I'm, I'm deeply sorry. Um, most of us did not not have our, 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 our jobs threatened or bankruptcies to our companies, but you know what? We all suffered. And, and how do I know that people suffered who actually didn't, weren't directly touched by the coronavirus epidemic? Well, because I'm looking at the emergence of what is now being termed by clinical psychologists as what they call COVID anxiety syndrome, a, a level of clinical anxiety heretofore unknown that's only explainable by living through these conditions of extreme isolation, um, tension, the inability to actually make human contact that people have become accustomed to. 43% of adults have experienced high loneliness during lockdowns. And this is on top of, this is exacerbating what our, our wonderful uh, Surgeon General Vivek, Vivek Murthy calls the epidemic of loneliness. This has supercharged the epidemic of loneliness, particularly people in their 20s. So we find that the people in their 20s are less likely to have uh, romantic relationships than they have in the past. They're less likely to have a, a, a strong group of close friends than they have in the past. And this was before the epidemic. The epidemic has, has supercharged these things such that basically half of adults are experiencing high loneliness, which is, this is unknown territory in mental health for us. Depression has risen by about a factor of three. As a matter of fact, depending on who you believe on this, and this is there's a lot of literature on this that goes in all different directions, but ordinarily you would say that about 9% of the population exhibits a, a, a symptoms of clinical depression at any particular time. It's more like 30% of the population right now. And, and this has huge economic impacts. So um, the JAMA is now saying that we're, we're between one and a half and $2 trillion in the economic impact that's coming from the emotional problems stemming from the coronavirus epidemic, you know, in lost productivity, um, in, in, uh, in the wage issues, the unemployment issues, the, the mental health issues that actually are going through the, the health system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, bottom line, this is a big problem for you. It's a big problem for me. You have to be living on another planet not to have suffered over the past year and a half. I think that's settled. The real question that's not settled is what can you do? What can I do? What can we do to go from the post-traumatic stress to post-traumatic growth and come out of this thing better than we went in. And I'm gonna offer real practical ideas. I'm gonna offer three life lessons and how you can use your experience over the past year and a half, no matter how bad it was, 
to get stronger, to get better, to get happier. Number one is going to be a primer on managing our feelings so they don't manage us. Number two is I'm going to give you some cautions about the world's commercial solutions to the things that we're experiencing and how we can battle back. And this is going to be particularly relevant right now, given how Facebook is in the news. And then, ta- and then I'm going to talk about the biggest opportunity of all, which is to see the life changes coming at us, not as a, not as a tragedy, but rather as a, an opportunity that we can lean into. And if we do the three things we're talking about, we'll, I, we will... I dare say, um, get happier. I was going to say money back guaranteed, but you know, you're know you not paying for this and I'm not getting paid. So that's really pretty much of a false promise. Let's start with our feelings. Now, one of the things I do a lot of lecturing on is how to manage feelings. Um, and, and part of the reason I do that is because most people feel managed by their feelings. And there's a very, a very easy reason for this. Some of you are very sophisticated in this information. So we're going back to you know your undergraduate years, so forgive me for this, but just to give everybody kind of a level set on the on the neurophysiology of feelings, emotions, um, basic emotions are processed basically automatically in the limbic system of the brain, which is a system of you know a deep part of the brain that was fully evolved by a million years ago over a you know multi million year process of of, of evolution often called the lizard brain in the vernacular, just because it's such a basic part of the brain where things happen automatically. Uh, Danny Kahneman calls it system one. There's all kinds of different ways to talk about this. But the bottom line is that this is your automatic onboard processing for outside stimuli so they can translate into the feelings that you need to behave automatically and appropriately to the stimuli. So for example, let me, let me, let's talk about, you know, anything that would happen. You're suddenly interested in something. Well, that's your limbic system actually responding and, and working with a neurotransmitter called dopamine to focus you in on something that's really interesting. Why? Because over the evolutionary process, it's good for you to be interested in things so that you can learn, make progress um, and survive. Um, the basic positive emotions are in fact, interest and love and joy. Now, emotion researchers are not uh, all of a of one mind on this. And so different people call different things, basic emotions. And, and this is kind of a, I, I'm getting as close as I can to a consensus here, but there is, a, a, I, I should note that there's a little bit of controversy about which are the basic emotions. The basic negative emotions are sadness, anger, and disgust and fear. And these are the things that we don't like, but, but guess what? You need basic negative emotions arguably even more than you need basic positive emotions because these are your system for self-defense. It's very clear of the evolutionary process that people who have, who have really acute, uh, very strong uh, um, emotional, negative emotional systems, they tend to survive and pass on their genes. And there's all kinds of reasons for them. They, they, they for, for example, they keep you safe because you're on high alert uh, through your fear, through your disgust for a pathogen, through your anger that actually comes that actually makes you want to defend yourself naturally. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind. But here's the problem. I mean, thank goodness for our basic emotions. Three cheers for our basic emotions. But it, in modern life, where we don't have too many saber-toothed tigers chasing us around and, and we're not in danger of you know, consuming a poison at any given moment, so we have to be acutely aware of the disgust that we might feel, be feeling for a smell or for a taste or something, we're maladapted to how our negative emotions are tending to dominate our, our, our person. In other words, we tend to be managed by negative emotions a lot, and that's a big problem. They make us miserable, they make us unhappy, and they can make us ruminate. They can actually put us into a lot of the syndromes that we see that we classify as mental health problems. So a, a lot of depression and anxiety has to do with the, the over-management of us by our negative emotions running wild and maladapted to the social situations in which we find ourselves. The question is really not to get rid of basic emotions, on the contrary. It's how we can manage them appropriately under our current circumstances. So how do you do it? How do you do it? And this actually takes us not from the world of of neuroscience and social science, this is gonna take us backwards a couple of thousand years to, uh, to the Greek philosophers and to the Buddhist thinkers and to ancient Vedic wisdom about how to manage 
a feelings problem. Now, there's lots and lots of different ways to put this. I have studied uh, quite a bit in Dharamsala with the Tibetan Buddhist monks and His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and they always will teach me the same thing. They'll always say, that you need to observe your feeling, observe your emotions, observe your emotions. What are they saying when they're telling you to observe your emotions? Well, a very simple thing is what they're saying. They're saying, take the feeling that's originating in the limbic system of your brain and move it into the prefrontal cortex of your brain. That's the big meaty lobes of your brain behind your, behind your forehead. <clears throat> and that's where your executive center functions. That's where your conscious thought functions. And when you observe your emotions, you're basically moving those emotions to a part of your brain where you are more in control. Not entirely, but a lot more. And in so doing, you can go from being managed by emotions to at least partly managing your emotions. So this is incredibly good psychology that the Lord Buddha proposed some 2,500 years ago, where he said to observe your feelings. That is something that we will often talk about in Western social science as metacognition. It is awareness of uh, actually what's going on in your mind to observe your feelings consciously, to make them metacognitive. I'm aware of my awareness to, to no small extent. That's the first step in managing a feelings problem. So let's think about this. If you're having too much anger, you're being dominated by your sadness and it's holding you back. The first step in this process is observing it. It's saying, I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling, I'm feeling afraid right now. And by the way, fear is the master emotion. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about this here in a second. Fear is what, what occupies the biggest part of your limbic system because it's what keeps you alive. But if you're dominated by it and it's actually getting in the way of your love relationships, the first thing to do is to say, I'm feeling afraid right now. Okay, the second step is to analyze it. This is making it even more metacognitive. This is making it even more manageable by saying, why do I have this feeling? Why is it? At, why does it actually exist? In, what is the origin of this? This is all happening in your prefrontal cortex, and now it's really your manager is in control of these things. You're getting more and more control, mastery over this, which is a wonderful thing. And finally, the management kicks into high gear, which is to do three things: to accept the feeling, to resolve not to let it bind your actions, and then to turn it into an opportunity. Now, this is a basic master class on how this works, and it's not going to be really helpful unless I, I give you an example. So that's what I'm going to do now, an example related to the coronavirus epidemic. Now, what have we all felt over the past year and a half? The main source of discomfort for most people that are not suffering from the disease or losing loved ones is just uncertainty. You know, I would talk to people all the time, and they're afraid. I might get sick. Will I get sick? Will I lose somebody I love? Will I lose my job or my business or you know my retirement savings? And actually, here's a big one. Will life ever return to normal? Will I ever have a date in real life or is it going to be on Zoom forever? Will I ever see my friends again? I haven't seen my brother. I love my brother. I haven't seen my brother in two years. It's just, it's ridiculous. And, and a lot of people are very, very uncertain about the future. This is the biggest problem that we're actually having. So why is this a problem in the context of unmanaged negative basic emotions? Let's go back to the master emotion. The master emotion is fear. Fear will clear the deck of all other emotions, no matter what you're feeling. Now, one of the interesting things that neuroscientists will tell us is that, that fear, once again, occupies more physical space in the brain for processing than any of the other emotions. It, you're a fear machine is the bottom line because look, until relatively recently and sometimes even still today, the world's a pretty scary place and you need to be ready. Fight, flight, or freeze and you need onboard computing hardware that make that possible. Fear is a response to threat and it's unbelievable how it works. The body reacts to, to threats that, 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 that provoke fear in about 74 milliseconds. So let me tell you just a sketch of what's happening. Let's say that you're walking across the street in Cambridge. You're going to your office. You're going to your work, wherever you're going. And, and a car runs a red light and it's about to run you over in the, in the, in the crosswalk. Now, your visual cortex will process the car coming toward you 
way before anything conscious is going on in your brain. That stimulus actually that lights up your amygdala, which is these two, they're not actually red, like in this, uh, like in this picture, this process that's created from a functional MRI, MRI machine, but this is just for effect, that, that your amygdala will light up in reaction to the to the stimulus that's crossing your visual cortex. This sends an automatic reaction to your pituitary glands, which in turn stimulates your adrenal glands, which are right above your kidneys. Okay, way down by your kidneys, and they will immediately spit out um, adrenaline, epinephrine, and cortisol. These are these stress hormones, and all of this is happening in less than, in less than 100 thousandths of a second. This is way before you know what's going on. You're seconds behind in your prefrontal cortex. Your prefrontal cortex, this lazy big thing is probably three seconds later, you figure out what just happened. By the time you know what's actually going on, your heart is beating and, and your, your pulse is way up, you're sweating and you probably already flipped off the driver and all of that was automatic, right? It's like, wow, I can't believe all of that happened. Thank God for the amygdala. Thank God for the master emotion. Here's the problem uncertainty about what we were just talking about. Remember, uncertainty about the coronavirus epidemic. Uncertainty is stimulating the fear emotion at a low level, at a constant gnawing kind of fear. Not the fear that's making you jump out of the way of the oncoming car. It's the fear that, that simply gives you a maybe a little drip of that cortisol, a little bit of a drip of that that, that, that epinephrine or norepinephrine that's keeping you awake at night. Now, there's really interesting data that shows, for example, that, that if you're having trouble sleeping during the coronavirus epidemic, did you? I did. Why is that probably? Well, there are two alternating hormones that govern your sleep. They're cortisol and, and, and melatonin. And what happens is if your cortisol level, which is supposed to dip when you're about going to sleep and then come up at four, at five or, five or six in the morning to wake you up naturally, if the cortisol level is raised across the entire sleep cycle, it means it's gonna to be too high when it's time to get up and it's gonna to be too high too early before you wanna get up. So if you have trouble going to sleep or you're waking up too early, it's probably because your cortisol levels are elevated. Why are they elevated? Well, there's one possibility which is that the uncertainty is actually stimulating a little bit of it in your brain vis-a-vis -vis the system that I'm describing here. Don't be managed by this if you can. So how, what do we do? Well, if you're not thinking about this in a, in a, in a, in a well-structured way, there are two ways that we often do this. Number one is what we call avoidance. Avoidance behavior is very, very common. And the way to do that is to say, there's something I don't like, so I'm just gonna not think about it. Now, some of you can't do that, but some people do this a lot. And there's a very interesting literature that shows that when there's uncertainty in people's lives or there's worry in people's lives and they avoid it, they simply they, they suppress these ideas, that the stress tends to come out in other areas and other sorts of bizarre behavior. So there's a big literature that shows that, that eating disorders, bulimia, anorexia nervosa are, are intimately tied to avoidance behavior of loss of control in our lives. Now, I always saw that and I know that as a social scientist, but I remember one time when, uh, when my kids were little and I have three kids, um, my middle son, his name is Carlos and Carlos was always a really tough guy. I mean, here's Carlos. This is, this, is, this is Carlos here, okay? Carlos, he is a Lance Corporal in the US Marine Corps. He's a forward deployed combat Marine. He's a tough hombre. And when he came back, I remember when, one day when he came back when he was six years old from first grade and he announced he wasn't gonna eat anything except peanut butter. Nothing but peanut butter sandwiches. And I'm like, what are you talking about? That's it's ridiculous. And it really annoyed me, I have to say, and I kind of leaned on him, you can't do that and the whole thing. And I was talking to my neighbor complaining about it that day. And I said, Carlos has decided he's not gonna eat anything but peanut butter. And my neighbor had 10 kids. This guy was like running a school basically. And he said, he'd seen everything under the sun. He said, well, did Carlos get a new teacher in school or something? And I said, yeah, how did you know that? He said, oh, it's always the same. When they lose control in one area of life, they exert control in another area of life. Well, we do that too. That's called avoidance behavior. If you try to avoid something that's bothering you, you will continue to be managed by the emotion, but in an area you don't anticipate. It could be worse. Don't do that. That's, that's uh, 
let's just say that a strategy number, bad strategy number one. Bad strategy number two is information binging. One of the things that people do constantly when they have a lot of uncertainty is that they try to turn it into risk. Now, these are not the same thing. And, uh, uncertainty is, is something where we don't know what the we don't know what the odds are. I mean, we don't know what the the, the, we know the circumstances might be. We don't know how bad things might get. We don't know what the cat catastrophes are that might befall us. So we can't assign probabilities to them. And so therefore we can't manage any contingencies. Risk is better. Risk is not something that we like, but it doesn't actually provoke fear because we know what the possibilities are. So we can assign probabilities. And so we can manage those probabilities. One of the reasons that I love the insurance industry I know I can't believe it. Those words just crossed my, my, my lips. I love insurance. Why? Because it's a happiness business. Happiness literally, I mean, insurance is literally the only industry that converts systematically uncertainty into risk. And that raises people's happiness. Well, if you can't do that, if you can't buy insurance against the information that you don't know, you try to binge on information on the internet or on cable television to get as much information as you can, watching three, four, five hours a day. Maybe some of you were you know, refreshing the Johns Hopkins coronavirus epidemic website every hour for the like, you know, these old experiments where monkeys would be administering cocaine to themselves. You know, it's like click, 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 click every every 30 minutes for days at a time. You were information binging because you were trying to turn uncertainty into risk to mitigate this intense uh, discomfort that you were getting from the constant drip from your from your adrenal glands. Those are bad strategies because they don't work. They don't work and they can have unintended secondary consequences. So what should you do instead? Here's the uncertainty action step so that you can manage the emotion as opposed to the emotion managing you. And I got this idea in no small part from a friend of mine who's a late stage oncologist, somebody who specializes in, I mean, he's the person where uh, he says, I just... I, I just got your tests and you need to step into my office, which is not what you want to hear from your oncologist, to be sure. He's somebody who says, this is a very uh, highly progressed cancer. And so he sees a lot of people who are freaked out, for sure. And I asked him, what do people do? And he said, they always do the same thing. You know, they want to run home and Google their cancer and then look in the page for prognosis. Why? Because they want to turn their uncertainty into risk. Because they want to get some sort of comfort to lower this horrible fear that they're feeling. He says that they, that's not what they should do. He says he recommends that they do something else instead. And, and this is good advice for all of us in the coronavirus or in any part of our lives. Again, what are we trying to do? Learn from the COVID-19 problem for the rest of our lives. He says, observe the feeling, which is what we call metacognition a minute ago. I'm experiencing fear from uncertainty. I can't avoid it. This is analysis. I can't avoid it or convert it into risk by binging on information. I'm, I'm just not going to sort this out by, by cruising the web. And here's the most important part of the management. Like, I don't know what's going to happen today and tomorrow and next week or next year, but I will not waste the gift that is this day. It's what he tells his patients. And that's good advice for all of us, no matter what we are experiencing, isn't it? You don't know what's going to happen today. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or next week. It could be good. It could be bad. But if you're focused on that because you're afraid, you will waste the gift that is this day. Rebel against that and embrace this day. He says that if you repeat these steps to yourself every day, you will be managing your own emotions. And it's perfect science. It's also good philosophy. That's number one. Now, Number two, let's start talking about another source of discomfort that we're feeling, which is the loneliness itself. This is a little graphic that the Washington Post did for a column. I, used to, I, I write for the Atlantic now. I used to be a columnist in the Washington Post. And, and I was writing about the loneliness at the very beginning of the coronavirus epidemic. And they, one of their wonderful artists put this together because this is kind of how it felt, right? You know, there's other people, but they're on the pane of glass, the Zoom screen, the two-dimensionality of the people that we love. And, and people would often say to me that they were intensely uncomfortable because of the loneliness, almost physically uncomfortable because of the loneliness. Well, actually, that's not just some sort of a metaphor. It hurts to be alone. Actually, it does hurt to be alone. 
because of this. There is a neuropeptide that functions as a hormone called oxytocin, which is often called by a neuroscientist the love molecule. This is the structure of it, for those of you who are chemists, and many of you are more expert in this than I am, and so I say all these things with appropriate humility. Um, and oxytocin is a, has a really interesting role. What it, it's actually a miracle. It binds us to other people. You get your biggest burst of oxytocin when you lay eyes for the very first time in your newborn infant. So those of you who have children, like I do, I mean, I remember holding my, my first son for the first time and he looked up into my eyes and something just exploded inside my brain. Amazing. One of my children is, is, is adopted. And I remember wondering, I'm a social scientist, so it's like, how fun am I? Wondering if I'm going to get the same burst of oxytocin. And sure enough, you know, she was a year and a half old and they put her in my arms and she grabbed my shirt and looked up at me with her little eyes and boom, it happened again. I mean, oxytocin is incredible. You see a long lost friend, you see your parents for the first time, you see your children. It's just the most wonderful thing. It binds us to each other. Now, now neuroscientists will often say that it's a good evolutionary mechanism. We need oxytocin so we don't inadvertently leave the baby on the bus or something. But, but you know, this is a source of happiness. If you have experienced discomfort, almost physical discomfort during the loneliness that came from the lockdowns and the isolation of the coronavirus epidemic, it's because you had a, uh, you had a scarcity of oxytocin. And that lack of oxytocin in your brain, maybe it made it harder to sleep. It maybe made it harder to focus. It probably made you grumpy. It probably made you sad because when you don't get enough oxytocin, life is just not that great. So what'd you do? Well, you probably, some of you at least, turned to one of the world's solutions, the commercial solutions, because guess what? Markets are going to give you all kinds of solutions. And the most prominent of those during the social media, during the social, uh, during the coronavirus epidemic was social media. So what you found is massive increases across all age groups in the consumption of Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok, all of it, because people wanted to connect with each other. But there's a problem here, my friends, there's a problem. I gave you the um, uh, analogy a minute ago about the the, 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 the macronutrients in food. Well, one of the things that we find, one of the really interesting things, uh, public health problems that we see that many of you are involved in and, and are quite expert in is the fact that the public health crisis that we have surrounding the epidemic of obesity in America. And obesity is a really interesting problem because you know, it, it has everything to do with the fact that we have more than we need in our economy to meet our caloric needs. And in fact, we have a calorie to nutrient ratio problem. <laughs> you know, a lot of nutritionists will say that the best way to lose weight, it's not easy, but the best way to lose weight is simply to, is to eat nutrient dense food and never eat when you're not hungry. Your body will tell you when you've met your nutrient needs is the whole point. Now it's not as simple as that, but, but it's a non-trivial understanding of the problem at hand. Now, why do I bring that up? because we have all of this food that's highly, highly, highly caloric and delicious and nutrient poor. That's called junk food. That is the equivalent of social media. Social media is the junk food of our social needs. It is very, very, very high in the amount of time that it takes and very, very low in the oxytocin that it produces. There's more and more research that's starting to emerge that shows that when you're looking at social media, when you're getting social contact from social media, you get a tiny trickle of oxytocin where what you need is a flood. And so what do you do? You binge. So basically your social media habits are like living at McDonald's. You're eating burgers and fries and it's so delicious. So I don't know why, but two hours later I'm hungry again because you didn't meet your nutrient needs. You met your caloric needs days ago, but you still have these nutrient needs. Same thing with social media. If you, you look at it and then you're still lonely and you feel sort of satisfied, but five minutes later, you're doom scrolling again, it's because your oxytocin needs are not being met. This is a big problem. Now, there's a lot of research from uh, somebody that I've had on my show before named Gene Twenge at San Diego State University, who says that all of your social media combined should add up to less than an hour a day because anything more than an hour a day, you will literally get lonelier the more you use it. Think about that. That's like eating more and more and more and getting hungrier as you eat. It's worse than junk food. It's dangerous for you. 
So what should you do instead? You need oxytocin boosters, and those come from within. Now, oxytocin comes from two sources, eye contact and human touch. So one of the things that we need to do is purposive eye contact. I'm not against the technology that we're using right now, but we need to use it for more than these professional purposes. Use them for social reasons, Skype, FaceTime, Zoom, any of these technologies. And when you do, you need to look into the camera like I'm doing right now, because that eye contact actually will stimulate more oxytocin as long as people reciprocate in that and you're talking to people that you love. The second is that you need more therapeutic touch. Oh, by the way, this is my, my dog, Chucho. He's a very good boy. He actually died and I miss him a lot. You can get oxytocin by making eye contact with your dog. And, and, and here's a really interesting piece of research that shows that, that dogs and canines being evolved in parallel, dogs get a big oxytocin burst when you make eye contact with them too, especially when you touch them. So one of my friends, a guy named Paul Zach at Claremont Graduate University in California, he shows that when you touch and pay attention to your dog and make eye contact, your dog gets a 56% increase in blood oxytocin levels, which is like being madly in love. Your dog literally loves you. Your cat, by the way, gets a 12% oxytocin boost. So, you know, your dog loves you. Your cat tolerates you for now. I mean, that's the most obvious thing in the world. So, okay. Second thing is touch. And, and given the fact that if you are a more isolated than you would have been under different circumstances, which we all were during the coronavirus epidemic, you need more therapeutic, systematic touch with the people around whom you are living. Now, some people lived alone, so this was not open to them, but most people weren't. The problem was that they weren't having enough contact with the people they were living with. They were in the same amount of contact as before, but they have no contact with others. And so they were getting lonelier and having oxytocin problems. I recommend about a 20 second therapeutic hug every two hours for the people that you live with. This will be good for your relationships, but you will find yourself getting happier because your neurochemistry will rebalance under these circumstances. Get rid of the social media, get more eye contact and hug and love more people in person. Okay, last but not least, let's talk about the changes in our lives and how we can turn this into a source of transcendence. You know, the, the coronavirus epidemic was a classic bait and switch. You know, people are pretty dubious of the authorities because they kept changing the, I mean, and again, God bless them. I mean, if you're Dr. Anthony Fauci, you're, you're being forced to say you know more than you do. I mean, being a public health official under the, under the circumstances, I'm very close with Dr. Scott Gottlieb. He's, he worked for me in Washington for a long time. And he was being asked to say things that he didn't know the answers to, but I don't know, just kind of isn't good enough. And so people were speculating a lot. The public health officials were telling us that this was going to be a, a momentary or a temporary interruption. And it turned into a transition. It turned into kind of a new way of life. People ask, you know, what does this mean? Zoom forever? Well, yeah, maybe. I mean, there are a lot of jobs that are never going back and there are a lot of meetings that aren't going to, and we're going to be doing hybrid stuff forever. What about contact with people? What about the institutions that I actually love? Let's think about that and what that means and how we can make it into something better. Now, to begin with, the amazing thing about transitions like the coronavirus epidemic is that we're always so shocked. It's like, this has never happened. This hasn't happened since the flu epidemic of 1918. Wrong. Every 10 years, something this big happens. It just does. If you're more than 30 years old, you've lived through four of these things that fundamentally changed sort of life on earth. I mean, the fall of the, you know, the Eastern Bloc, the end of the Cold War fundamentally changed geopolitics and the way that we do business. Now, maybe that affected you a little, maybe that affected you a lot. If you were in Eastern Europe, it really affected your life. But even in the States, it was non-trivial. 10 years later, about a decade later, 9-11, this was the end of an era and the beginning of a new era. Um, people who didn't live before that, they have, you tell them the stories about what it was like to go to the airport, they had no idea. Transportation changed, security changed, national security, our, our foreign policy changed. Decade after that was, the, was the, the financial meltdown, which we didn't know if the ATMs were gonna keep working. People who graduated from college during that period, they still have not caught up. We could arguably say, and I have data that shows, I think proves that, that you know, the, the political populism and polarization in American life today still owes to the financial crisis. It's affecting our lives. 10 years later, the coronavirus epidemic. The truth is, 
every 10 years, there's something this big. It's just different than the last one. And the problem is that 10 years from now, we're going to have the next crisis, but we're going to be talking about pandemics and financial crises and not ready for the next one because we don't know what it is. But don't, don't be surprised. Just be ready not to fix it, but to grow as a result of it. Why do we hate it? We hate it because of what we call negativity bias. When anything is changing, we always look at the negative side of the change. Unless we're, this is what we call in my business, unusually neophilic. This is a neologism. It basically just means love of new things. And some people, I mean, I'm crazy about new things and new adventures and doing new stuff, but I'm not normal in this way. Most people don't want new things all the time. And so the result of that is that they, they have a negativity bias, which is a, an evolved trait in which we say, I'm going to look for and notice the negative because that's going to keep me alive when there's change to the current status quo. That's why we hate change. That's why these types of changes are so uniformly regarded as negative experiences. The problem, I mean, I, the, the, the interesting thing, however, is that as time passes, our negativity bias flips into something we call the fading affect bias. Have you ever noticed that that if you, let's say some of you celebrate Christmas, if you celebrate Christmas, you always notice that current Christmases are a little disappointing compared to when you were a kid. The reason is because you have fading affect bias. You remember things in the past as better than they were because what stays with you were the good experiences and the things that you learned. Fading affect bias gives you warm memories. The reason that people find holidays kind of unsatisfactory chronically is not because they're worse now, it's because they weren't as good as you remember them in the past because of this fading affect bias. Now, back to the coronavirus epidemic. We have a negativity bias saying this change that we're going through right now is terrible, 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 awful, awful. Fading affect bias is gonna make us, if we do it right, remember things during this time as kind of sweet, kind of good, as a matter of fact, if we let it. Now, this is the important thing to keep in mind. Periods of change, which we refer to as liminality, a liminal state, they stimulate a lot of creativity and growth. The problem is if we lean out of this, if we, if we say we don't want this, if we fight this, if we resist this, then all we're going to get is the negativity. We won't grow and we won't get the fading affect bias later on. So what does this tell us? This tells us that we need to, as, you know, all of your intuition says, lean out, resist, resist. What you need to do is lean into the changes that are happening in your life. They feel bad. Lean in and learn. Say, this is the way it's going to be. Just run toward the change. If you can, you'll get the maximum amount of fading affect bias. You'll learn the most and you'll get the greatest happiness and creativity and growth. So how do you do it? Arthur, can I just, sorry, can I just jump in so we can have the greatest happiness for everyone in the in the meeting? We are close to time, but we do have some questions. I'm wondering if maybe you have just a couple more comments to wrap up and then yep, we would- I'm, I'm wrapping up right now. Perfect. So the key thing that people are talking about is what they liked before the pandemic and what they hate during the pandemic. That's the wrong place to focus your time. Focus your time on the things you didn't like before the pandemic and what you're not going to go back to and find ways to think about what you like during the pandemic that you enjoy that you want to keep. If you do this, you have the maximum likelihood of getting fading affect bias and the greatest happiness from this. So here's where we are. You didn't choose COVID-19. It chose you. You choose your reaction. The cir this circumstance is an opportunity to get stronger and we can look back on it together as a kind of a beautiful time of growth if we do the things that we talk about here. And with that, I'm gonna go back to you. Thank you, sorry to jump in. We just have some questions and I wanted to make sure um, people would have a chance to ask them. Um, and I, you know, I think your comments about the uh, um, opportunities to reevaluate what's good about during the pandemic. It, certainly there are a lot of people clearly doing that with what, you know, as we're seeing lots of people are choosing not to go back to other jobs and, you know, going to new jobs and thinking about what they valued about their jobs. Um, so thank you for a really thought provoking um, time and session. We have um, an opportunity for a couple questions. I do have one in the chat that I'll pose. And then if people have others they want, you can either send it to everyone or just send it to me. 
So this is a question, it um, reads, Dr. Richie Davidson's research, Healthy Minds Innovation, which is an affiliate at University of Wisconsin-Madison, yep. focuses on developing the skill of well-being via the power of neuroplasticity. What practical ways do you recommend for tapping into this process so that we would all have more self-compassion in our lives? So Richie Davidson uh, and I have both worked together with the Dalai Lama and his work is really fundamental. The most important thing that he does for, for those of us in this community, look, we're a bunch of intellectuals and academics here. And, and there's a tendency to think that that holds us back, that that actually, that it, it, it makes us rigid, it handcuffs us a little bit as, as opposed to having this experience. What Richie Davidson actually finds is that the more that you can wish you were happier, you won't get happier. But if you study it, you will. So this is the key thing. If you want more mastery, if you want more happiness, if you want more emotional stability, you need to do, you need to become a student of this. This is such a beautiful thing, isn't it? Knowledge is emotional power. I mean, it's just, I'm so happy to find this. You know, that, uh, you know, everybody's walking around saying, oh, I wish I were happier. But how many friends do you say like, you know, I wish I had a better job. You say, you're looking for a new job? No. Well, you know, you got yourself to blame, right? A lot of people wish they were happier, but they're not doing the work. Do the work, read the studies, become a student of this, become a happiness hobbyist. That's what Richie Davidson's work really clearly shows. He has a brand new article on this, a, a meta-analysis across, across a whole bunch of studies that show this, that the more you know, the better off you are and the more emotional stability that you'll enjoy. All right. Uh, we have another question in the chat, um, which I think is, uh, I will pose the specific question and then tell you what I think is the broader um, implication. So any suggestions for single people who don't have that many opportunities to hug? You gave the recommendation of hug someone every two hours. And I think, you know, in terms of practicality or yeah. is there, is there yeah. an alternative or a substitute for that um, that would suit the purpose? Yeah. So to begin with, the good news is that we're not in lockdown anymore. And so we, all, we actually all can legally and relatively safely, you know, given our vaccination status, we can actually have more human contact. And I recommend that people do that. I mean, we've gotten into patterns where we're, we're used to not shaking hands, we're not touching each other, and this, this stupid elbow bump is the worst thing ever. But, you know, the truth is building up relationships with friends, again, who have also been vaccinated, where, you're, where there is a, a certain amount of safety, and, and using this as a therapeutic opportunity to actually have more human contact, more physical contact, get back into the habit. That's the bottom line. Also, you know, it's interesting that the, the, the puppy market has increased by 250% during the coronavirus epidemic. There's a lot of hugging going on there too, which is not a really a very bad idea. But the bottom line is that people are better. Hug more people who you safely and, and let's say appropriately can do it. Get back into the habit, as, as my, even if you're not living with people. Okay. Um, I, I have a question that I'll pose as a prerogative as the moderator, and then there's another one in the chat that I'd like to get to. Um, so uh, you talked about how social media, like no more than an hour a day, and, and there's certainly plenty of research that, you know, suggests that social media can be harmful. At the center, we've been having a fairly nuanced discussion about social media with the argument, and I don't know, Vish, if you want to jump in on this, but with the argument that... Um, you know, there are benefits of social media for well-being as well as for ill-being. So I don't know if you, Vish, do you want to add anything to that or, and then we can invite Arthur to comment or? You're on. Sorry, I was on mute. You know, it's, it's a classic uh, street lamp effect or what I would call it. You know, people are looking, researchers are looking only for the bad side of social media. So that's what most studies are finding consistently. Right. But there are also functional sides to it in terms of increasing cohesion, sense of cohesion, neighborliness, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, and other kinds of positive effects. You know? yeah. So so I'm just curious, uh, you know, I, I think that's what Laura is asking. There's a more nuanced approach to social media than, than what's being in the public discourse. So, yeah, sure. And, you know, it's like, in, it's like anything else, though, how you, how responsible you use a particular tool 
can can make it a, a blessing or a curse. And and moderation is always key and using it in concert with your actual relationships is important. There's been a long, you know, there's if you look at the research on on alcohol use, for example, most of it talks about the dangerous aspects of alcohol use. But the truth is that alcohol can be really good for relationships and a really nice part of your life, but you have to be extremely moderate and very conscious and very mindful about your use. And the same thing is true with, with social media that you know you have to ration it it should only be a it should be part of uh, a complement to your your actual human relationships you should stay away from social comparison we shouldn't be using it when we're under 13 years old there's a whole bunch of things like that that sound an awful lot by the way like what we talk about with drugs and alcohol so that you know that substances like that can be a uh, an affirming part an enjoyable part of our life as opposed to becoming a curse i think it's very much along those lines it's not a, a it's not a manichaean it's not a black and white thing where it's pure it's a pure bad it's not like poison gas thank you okay we have another question in the chat i don't want to look at all of these but let me pose this one and then also sort of broaden it a little bit too so we have a question saying, do you have any suggestions on dealing with divisiveness that many of us are experiencing with regard to the wide chasm of belief around vaccines and pandemic precautions? Friendship has been quite challenged. And I will sort of broaden that out to the question of how much do you think the research on happiness helps us understand pro-sociality and how people engage in social relationships? So their polarization right now, given the fact that it's a, it's it's transcendent of lots and lots of things in our society. I mean, the fact that it's kind of a vehicular part of the way that we're doing politics and policy today means that almost no matter what you talk about, it's going to become an excuse to fight the culture war. And predictably, the coronavirus epidemic became a battleground of the culture war and vaccines became a battleground of the culture war. I mean, anything can become a battleground of the culture war practically at this point. And the reason is because not because of the vaccines, but because we have a culture war. And so one of the things that I talk about, my last book was called Love Your Enemies. And that, was, that came out in 2019. So that's one of the key things I'm interested in is I want to be a warrior against the culture war, <laughs> ironically. And so I'm doing you know, three talks a week, mostly on the road. I'm mostly out of town. I'm not doing very much Zoom these days, as a matter of fact, about actually how to, how to lower levels of political polarization. And, and a, a large part of that actually has to do with making sure I mean, we have we all have strong opinions about politics and policy and the virus and and you know the treatments, et cetera. But to make sure that when we're talking about it, we are never guilty of treating other people with contempt. Contempt is this idea that somebody is worthless, what they say is worthless. And in so doing, it's an expression of hatred that makes it impossible for us to have a reasonable conversation with anybody else. And you might say that somebody is worthy of contempt, but that actually is not not a very good argument insofar as our goal should be to persuade other people and nobody in the history of humanity has ever been insulted into agreement, has ever been hated into assent for your particular point of view. So the whole thing that I talk about is in these conversations, looking for what we think of as unreasonable points of view as an opportunity for us to show the warm heartedness, to show the love, to show the reasonableness that will actually be the most compelling and, and will actually be most likely to take the fire extinguisher to the, to the hot and you know the flames of the culture war that we see today this should be in other words another excuse for social entrepreneurship to bring more love and reconciliation will we win every battle of course not but every single hostility that we see is an opportunity well on that kind of inspiring note thank you so much this so there are more questions in the chat but unfortunately we don't have time to address them all but i will say lots of people have expressed gratitude and appreciation and have also, you know, said that there are a lot of topics in here that they would love to hear more about. So thank you so much um, for giving us your time. I will just mention to folks um, that our next seminar is going to be Wednesday, November 17th. We have Dr. Andrew Steptoe, who's the head of the Department of Behavioral Science and Health at University College of London. He's also the director of the English Longitudinal Study of Aging. He's done an enormous amount of research in this domain on health and happiness. And his talk is going to focus on loneliness, well-being, and resilience during and after the COVID pandemic. So it's definitely going to be very relevant and related to what we've heard today. Um, so I hope we'll see all of you in another month. And in the meantime, thanks again to Arthur Brooks for a really wonderful and thought-provoking. Thank you. Thanks for the work that you're doing at the center. Um, thanks to all of you for, for coming to this. Let's, uh, let's work to lift people up and bring them together to create more happiness all around us and bring more love. Thank you. You're here.